Please be seated. Welcome and good evening. I was given a good luck dodecahedron here. <laughs> so, liberal education and the Cold War on a Friday evening. Captive audience here <laughs> playing to my base. The attendance might be a refutation of the argument, in, in fact. <laughs> I was with the junior class a couple of weeks ago and mentioned that this lecture was coming. And I said, uh, borrowing from Mel Brooks, the producers, I said, it'll be a gay romp. <laughs> Through the history of higher education in America and the Cold War, everybody's favorite subjects on a Friday evening. In fact, it's probably going to be more like General Ripper and Dr. Strangelove <laughs> ranting about purity of essence. <laughs> so. And because that's really more what it's like, I didn't want to scare the parents. First Friday of the semester, uh, I thought I'd inflict it on the alumni at, <laughs> at, at homecoming instead, and the freshman parents could have a lovely reading of uh, Genesis with Rana Berger, and it was, in fact, a lovely opening lecture that we had. Uh, as you all know, there'll be a question period uh, starting a few minutes after the, the break, after the lecture in the junior common room directly behind me. I had a friend in graduate school who wrote a paper once called, uh, titled, Philosophy as Bare Assertion. And there will be a lot of bare assertion in the next 45 or 50 minutes, and it should be challenged. So come to the question period, and uh, like Socrates, I think there's no greater favor you can do me than uh, show me where I'm in error. But uh, I imagine, I'm not sure, I imagine Aristotle says something like uh, criticizing or being criticized for minor errors is not becoming the magnanimous man. So keep that. <laughs> If he didn't say it, he should have said it, <laughs> and keep that in mind. And with that, I'll conclude the witty part of the evening. You'll have to come <laughs> to the question period for any more humor. Uh, welcome home to that. That's not really a joke, that, that last part. Uh, welcome home to our alumni, especially to the pioneer classes, including the first class enrolled on this campus in 1964. It is an honor to have many of you here this weekend. Your decision to attend St. John's in Santa Fe enabled us to begin the college's work and life here. And your story spans, composes, and reflects the history of our college and our community these last 50 years. Uh, I'd also like to extend a special welcome and recognition to the class of 2004 your senior year was my first year on the faculty, and unless I am mistaken, the last year I was publicly inebriated with students. Uh, so. that, that is the last joke. I wish you all a good homecoming celebration and celebration of our 50th anniversary year. I think I'll be speaking for about 50 minutes. My decision to consider liberal education from something like a historical point of view was occasioned in two ways. First, as dean, I was asked some time ago to address the question of why liberal arts colleges in so many ways have appeared to be on the defensive in recent years. I took some time to consider my varied hypotheses and to review some of the literature on this theme and some of the current lay of the land it led me to write and report on a couple of occasions what may seem unsurprising to many of you. I offered variations on the following formulations. There are identifiable and intelligible causes and trends for the decline of the American Liberal Arts College, economic, demographic, technological, political, and cultural. Certain of these tendencies seem inexorable, steadily shifting like tectonic plates. It seems likely that many institutions will change their character radically, be metabolized into other institutions, or go away. 
In fact, much of that has already happened. I could say more about what I see behind each of these categories, economic, et cetera, but the more I thought about it, the more convinced I became that the economic, demographic, and technological factors and trends were foregrounded for many observers at the expense of the political and cultural, and that the latter cut more deeply than do the former. This lecture is an exploration of this claim. The second occasion has been the general atmosphere of commemoration and historical reflection surrounding the year of our 50th anniversary, which itself followed by just two years, the celebration of the 75th anniversary of what some few still call the new program installed by Buchanan and Barr in Annapolis. One quickly saw that 2014 would be a striking year, marking the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, the 75th anniversary of the beginning of World War II, and the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989, and more broadly, of the year of the mostly peaceful revolutions of 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe. I hypothesized that the end of the Cold War, an end marked as well as anything by the fall of the Berlin Wall, had a decisive influence on the character or fate of liberal education, at least in America, an influence not favorable to liberal education. Hence, this might be a fitting theme to discuss with you so close to this important anniversary. To begin, several years ago, a former dean of our college opened a lecture from this podium with the following clause. One of the signs that liberal education is on the wane these days is, end quote, the sentence went on to discuss indifference to elementary logical distinctions. But let us stay with the subordinate clause. Is liberal education on the wane? Is it in decline? And if so, what are the causes of that decline? I share the view that liberal education is in decline. But immediately one is tempted to ask, what is meant by liberal education? What is meant by decline? I will try to offer these clarifications directly and indirectly over the course of the talk. But let me now amend my two general title. A more accurate title would be The End of the Cold War and the Decline of Liberal Education in America. The talk has three parts plus a conclusion. First, an overview of the long arc of higher education in America over the last 150 years, framing a discussion of some of the principal features of the Cold War period, understood as beginning after World War II, that is 1945 to 1989 or 1991. Second, an interpretation of the effect of that period on liberal education and the liberal arts college, and an interpretation of the effect of the end of the Cold War understood through the lens of Francis Fukuyama's end of history thesis as the post-Cold War situation in which we find ourselves. Third, I will then consider briefly some objections to this, some alternative viewpoints and alternative sources or starting points for liberal education. My basic thesis is that while it would make sense, in fact, many might find it uncontroversial to argue that liberal education and the liberal arts college in America have been in a long arc of decline or of displacement from the center of American education for 150 years or more. In fact, the Cold War and indeed the broader global or geopolitical contest of regimes spanning almost all of the 20th century provided invaluable energy and sources for renewal or preservation of various aspects of the tradition of liberal education in this country. And the end of the Cold War removed a bulwark or levy, and we are now facing an important and perilous acceleration of that longer arc of decline, or more neutrally, that longer arc of transformation of this tradition. Part one, history. The modest survey I have conducted of historians of American education reveals a story told at a very general level along similar lines. Beginning in the colonial period, there was about a century and a half in which the small liberal arts college was the dominant paradigm, typically Protestant and denominational, private, at first a modest imitation of English colleges, exclusively offering a version of the traditional liberal arts rooted in study of the classics and serving the needs of a small fraction of society, those in a position to join one of a few professions requiring a literate and liberal arts foundation, 
ministry, law, medicine, and teaching, for example. This early period has been followed by a century and a half in which the paradigm has shifted in various ways, but in almost all of those ways, moving away from that older paradigm. The rise of the natural sciences went together with the importation of the German or European university model, a faculty dedicated to specialized research and focused on the postgraduate training of the next generation of researchers and specialists. Economic modernization and the progressive shift from agriculture to industrial manufacturing to post-industrial white collar professional work went hand in hand with ever more of the working class needing to pursue or at least pursuing first high school completion then some college education in order to expand their economic opportunities. These economic and workplace needs drove the development of new institutions and new offerings focused on vocational and technical preparation and specialization. There was a great expansion in public or state funding of education, both at the primary to secondary level and in higher education, with the rise of land grant and public universities, again oriented to meet the need of the many to prepare for employment and to meet the need to support an increasingly technological and technical economy. Hence, increased need and increased support for the applied sciences, the health sciences, engineering, and so on. Similarly, there has been ever greater penetration of academic institutions by corporate, industry, or business funding, together with greater influence from industry on the curricula and programs offered, and on the institutional culture of higher education. Penetration analogous to, if less obvious and less decisive than, the greater involvement of government in all aspects of higher education. Meanwhile, there has occurred an expansion of the educational franchise, so to speak, with an ever larger percentage of the population first completing high school and then attending some post-secondary institution. This involved progressively more social mobility, that is more individuals from middle and lower income families attaining some post-secondary education, as well as the later added waves of socioeconomic revolution that expanded access to women and minorities. The character of the university and vocational models that arose also drove an increasing secularization of higher education, which eventually affected originally, insti uh, originally religious institutions as well. In many cases, they have lost entirely their denominational character, and in many, many others, it has become marginalized or simply symbolic or historical in character. From another angle, with the erosion of the foundational disciplines and ends of liberal education, there emerged the elective system as a system more in keeping with the ends of specialized technical and vocational preparation. Although there are reasonable arguments for why such a system might promote learning and excellence, their logic also reflects or implies the increasing preeminence of economics and its models on our analysis of choice, motivation, and competition. The consumer model of education and the priority of student choice and autonomy has become so prevalent as to almost lack an other against which to compare it. This long arc of modernization of higher education with its core components of a shift away from the liberal arts college to the university and vocational model and away from higher education as the preserve of a fortunate few to education as a right or a necessity for most people to be upwardly mobile economically and to have a range of career possibilities from which to choose together with the broader changes in the political and economic landscape changes that greatly expanded access all of this has to a large degree been a rising tide that raises all boats Higher education has seen enormous growth in students, in budgets, in economic and political significance across all its sectors over the last century and a half. But disproportionately, this growth has occurred with large, especially public institutions built on the university and vocational model. The liberal arts colleges have persisted and to a great extent transformed themselves to assimilate to these broader trends, but they represent and educate an ever smaller fraction of the college-bound population. This very general, very general depiction of the last 150 years includes the period of the Cold War, 
If we ask what this chapter looks like, specifically in the period 1945 to 1991, we would see that, again, a fairly common story is told. Most of the features of this story reinforce and are integrated into that broader trajectory. The icons of the early part of this era, after the duck and cover drills in primary schools, include Sputnik, NASA, the space race, the moon landing, and the arms race that underlay all of this. The most obvious and overwhelming effect, politically and economically, of the Cold War on higher education was that it drove the massive investment in public or government funding in order to prevail in the geopolitical, military, technological, scientific, and economic arms race with the Soviet Union. Culturally, the sciences, applied sciences, and the development of technology became the most respected and successful of our educational pursuits and products. The massive infusion of public funds completely transformed the character of some institutions. This was also the era of a new penetration of the academy by industry and business interests. It has been said by more than one commentator that the military industrial complex against which Eisenhower cautioned us would have been, would in fact have been better called the military industrial educational complex. Beyond this, the post-war demographic surge of college-bound students, driven first by the GI Bill and the wholesale entry of women into the workplace, and later by the baby boom and the progress of the civil rights movement, made ever-increasing funds available and spurred enormous growth and new investment and expansion of all sorts of programs, majors, professional schools, and so on. Then there were the more overtly political or polarizing aspects of the Cold War on college campuses. The McCarthy era and the Red Scare. The campus and student activism and revolt of the 1960s and 70s, fueled by the domestic tensions of the civil rights movement, by Vietnam and the anti-war movement, and by whatever we might consider as the broader cultural or countercultural or generational revolution of that era including popular culture, art, music, sexuality, and politics. Every, or almost every, aspect of American culture was touched by it in some way. More subtle, and like the GI Bill, as much a post-war, that is post-World War II, as a Cold War phenomenon, was the large-scale transfusion of European intellectual culture into the American Academy. In large part, the carriers were the emigre intellectuals themselves, but with them and alongside them, some of the strongest influences on the contemporary European scene became known and became part of the lingua franca of the American Academy and American culture. This happened with a rapidity and to a scale that seems difficult to imagine without the catastrophes in Europe from 1914 to 1945. Part two, the effects on liberal education. What was the effect of these forces on liberal education in America? I'm surprised how little I was able to find written directly on this question and how rarely I found something resembling the argument I inclined to, which might make me wonder if I am wrong, uh, but I'm not entertaining that, uh, <laughs> that path at the moment. So to repeat and put a finer point on what I would call the large scale and surface effect on the surface phenomenon of liberal education in America, that is its institutional existence as the traditional liberal arts college, traditional liberal arts disciplines. Much of what I described above, especially the priority to orient education toward victory in an economic and technological arms race and to invest unprecedented public funding behind this effort, these factors reinforced the erosion of the centrality or importance of the, liberal, of the liberal arts, including the disciplines themselves and their characteristic or first home in the small liberal arts college. The broad economic and public policy vectors put in place by the Cold War were not hospitable to the liberal arts college. Even if, as I suggested, some of these forces, together with the enormous growth in the college-bound population, were a rising tide that could raise all boats, the balance of power continued to shift and the paradigm continued to shift 
under the influence of these aspects of the Cold War period. However, there are two deeper senses of liberal education, less anchored in the particular cultural or historical home of the liberal arts college that were nourished, I believe, by other aspects of Cold War culture and consciousness, and in turn extended some credit to the ideal of the American Liberal Arts College as well. First, there is in the American founding and its apologetics and its rhetoric, the idea that there is a certain bond between liberal democracy, modern American constitutional democracy, as articulated in the founding documents and liberal education. This amounts to a new meaning of liberal education and an exceptional relation between this form of government and this ideal that long antedated it. Liberal democracy to survive and to be worthy of survival requires something of its citizens which other regimes do not. And part of the content of that successful democratic character must come through the preservation and extension of a liberal education to its leaders or its citizens. The fragility of democracy and its characteristic vices require this remedy among others. Second, what I consider the deepest sense of liberal education, one that makes it almost synonymous with philosophy, is the ideal of or pure dedication to the freedom of the mind as essential to our rational natures. Learning and knowledge for their own sake as pursuits necessarily beyond or transcending politics in all its senses, or at least transcending all regimes. This is a permanent human possibility where material and other conditions permit it. But it can also be, and came to America in this way, embedded and embodied in a tradition, the tradition of the classics going back to Greek and Roman antiquity. And in other places, it has been embodied in other traditions. There are perhaps obvious tensions between these two deep senses, as I'm calling them, of liberal education. One tied to an exceptional political regime, one super political or apolitical. But to some degree, the former, the liberal democratic deference to liberal education anticipates those tensions and tries to ameliorate or supersede them. In any case, there are tensions and each one is questionable. However, without a doubt, each one and the two together have captured and inflamed the imaginations of many and continue to do so. Both were inscribed in the educational and political rhetoric of the American Republic since its founding. It seems to me that certain aspects of the Cold War and of the preceding two great wars nourished these ideas and ideals. I infer this in part because of the apparent effect of the end of the 20th century conflicts. I offer the following features, truisms perhaps, of the Cold War, and I see these as hypotheses regarding the causes or conditions supporting liberal education in that period. First point, the Cold War was not just a war on the verge of happening, i.e. cold, or just a political or military conflict. It was also a great contest of regimes, of ideas of the best political community or best human community, of the best way of life, of justice, economic and political, and importantly, of freedom, a contest of ideas or ideologies, one could say the same of the period from 1914 to 1945. And in this sense, put in continuity, the whole period of geopolitical conflict in the 20th century. Second point, this was not an experience of conflict with a distant or alien political regime or ideal. The contest between the Western capitalist or market-based liberal democracies and Soviet Marxism-Leninism was fratricidal as they were staking rival claims to the same patrimony. Which regime was the rightful heir of the long development of Western science and enlightenment, of modern scientific, technological, and economic progress, of the emancipatory ideals of biblical religion, 
and of the modern political rights of man. This was an intramodern, intra-enlightenment, even intra-Western contest, at least in part. Third point, the outcome was uncertain. It was not obvious which side would emerge victorious. In particular, which side would harness sufficient military, technological, and economic might to defeat the other. And importantly, it was not certain either side or anyone else would survive the nuclear conflict if it was ever put to the test. Fourth point, the geopolitical contest was also mirrored by and greatly heightened the stakes of the internal division between the political left and right in America. Whatever one thought of the Soviet Union, the principled contest between capitalism and socialism communism was difficult to adjudicate, resting as it did on extremely difficult speculative and practical claims and arguments. Fifth and final point. Finally, and in a different register, simple and sophisticated, patri patriotic and partisan sentiment could only celebrate and elevate America's apparent attachment to freedom, to intellectual freedom and political and religious freedom, by contrast with a totalitarian regime that seemed in arguably unprecedented ways to suppress those very freedoms and to do so perversely in the name of a higher freedom or justice. These features of Cold War culture and consciousness served importantly and visibly, if not widely, to nourish and preserve not only the ideals of liberal education, but also a public, political, cultural, and institutional foothold for those ideals, for their importance to American or Western liberal democracy, and even for the liberal arts college as the iconic home or temple to these lesser gods. I will offer several suggestions for how they did so. I think I have six points here. First point, in a way that is closely tied to the very origin of philosophy, the meaningful heterogeneity of regimes, that is not simply a plurality of regimes, but a plurality of regimes that juxtapose and oppose different principles and different ways of life is the condition for the ascent to or concern with a higher standard of nature or being by which the rivals must be compared and adjudicated. Energetic rivalry among regimes at the level of or in the name of their principles keeps paramount or manifest the intellectual possibility of the ascent to what is natural and of the intellect's independence from or transcendence of politics as such. Second point, such heterogeneity often, or rather always, exposes or can expose the partiality of every regime. Every political order must naturally exaggerate its adequacy to the human good, to what is good by nature. And conversely, no regime is fully adequate to the human good, in part because of the irreducible complexity of the human good, and the irreducible difficulty of reconciling individual goods with human community. These problems may not be insoluble, but the laws and rhetoric of political communities that must provide our first education cannot operate in the element or on the plane in which such difficulties may find their resolution. Discovering the partiality of regimes may or may not require the experience of actually existing alternatives. But such experience appears to enhance both the discovery of and the ability to speak about and therefore reason together about such partiality. Third point, these conditions that encouraged deep reflection on what transcends and could adjudicate the Cold War contest, what could really ground our understanding of politics and the right way to live, dovetailed with the existential urgency or anxiety of the threat of nuclear war and of unprecedented capabilities for humanity to destroy itself or return itself to a thoroughgoing, if not pre-human, barbarism and eradication of civilization. In fact, the memory and burden of the destruction of the Second World War 
signified by Auschwitz and Hiroshima, as well as the scale of conventional military destruction, created something like the same level of urgency or anxiety after the fact, even absent or prior to the total nuclear threat. Fourth point, the intra-enlightenment and intra-modern contest of the Cold War invited, if not necessitated, a return to the arguments and accomplishments of the tradition of Western scientific, political, and philosophical culture to adjudicate or even to understand the character of the conflict, at least at a theoretical level. This had the effect of energizing study of the tradition, of the classics, giving them, especially the philosophic and scientific sources, arg arguably even greater urgency and relevance than they had in an earlier stage of American culture. This urgency was complemented by the character and intellectual reserves brought to America by the European emigres, who were more deeply educated in and more immediately familiar with the interpretive possibilities and problems of these sources, and more, and more familiar with a range of living schools of thought surrounding them. Fifth point, to some degree the McCarthy era polarization, but especially the later politicization and polarization of the academy in the 60s and 70s, and again in the culture wars of the late 80s and early 90s. However destructive these might have been to liberal education from certain vantage points, all of this amounted to a persistent affirmation that the intrinsic permeability of the humanities to politics and vice versa, or the intrinsic relevance of the humanities to the questions of politics and citizenship required that the liberal arts in some rather new shapes and perhaps as a remnant remain central to the culture of academic life and of student life at college or university. Even if the tendency, the new paradigm of higher education was toward the scientific, technical, and specialized and toward the vocational, the importance of our formation as citizens and the apparently deep conflict between political left and right on the campuses and beyond made the humanities a relevant, necessary, and prominent battleground. Sixth point, finally, and again in a different register, what I called the patriotic sentiment above led to a kind of American pastoral of the distinctively American liberal arts college, now understood or highlighted as private, as independent, as fundamentally non-sectarian or ecumenical, as nonpartisan, as cultivating individual and intellectual freedom, as a small local private association in Tocqueville's idiom, also as a repository of the classics, a place of free availability of the great works of the tradition elsewhere suppressed. Related to this, the ideal of intellectual freedom understood as academic freedom, as one of the natural rights preserved and protected by the limited claims of the Western state, by contrast with the totalitarianism it opposed was almost made sacred. Academic and intellectual freedom, a complex idea in the best of times, took on something like the immediate power that religious freedom in general, or Christianity in particular, wielded in rhetorical opposition to the godless, atheistic, communist state. Much of this, all of these points, can be heard in a conservative idiom. And indeed, some of the phenomena I intend to describe are, for me, most clearly seen that way. One could associate the forms given to this preservation or even enhancement of the ideals of liberal education with something I might call high cultural conservatism within the academy. I sometimes say that there is a continuity between William Buckley's God and Man at Yale, published in 1951, and Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind, published in 1987, a continuity that requires explanation. And the above analysis seems to me to be a significant part of that explanation. However, the overall depiction is not meant to be exclusively conservative. 
Again, one could see the far left student movements of the 60s and 70s as part of the Cold War period's enhancement of the great questions of higher education, an assertion that college above all is a time to raise and answer existentially the ultimate questions. This has something in common with, and more in common with, the deep, volatile ideal of liberal education than it does with the thin economic and vocational aims of higher education. To conclude and reiterate, even if one can point to the more obvious surface, to conclude this section, even if one can point to the more obvious, in fact, to conclude the first half of this section, <laughs> even if one can point to the more obvious surface or broad phenomena of economic modernization and public policy and all it entails for the university as steadily shifting the balance away from liberal education and the liberal arts college, these other forces encourage the preservation or even renewal of the ideals of liberal education. This is not just to say that this or that individual experienced these, but these represented a significant public, cultural, and political profile or foothold for the ongoing urgency of these claims. This even extended to an ongoing mythologizing or idealizing of the American Liberal Arts College as an American pastoral. What has changed? It appears to me that since 1989, all of the conditions or premises above and their beneficent influence on liberal education have weakened or vanished. In saying this, I take myself to be saying something very close to Francis Fukuyama's famous end of history thesis. Accordingly, I'm going to use his argument as a kind of lens, or perhaps better said, my claims are a kind of corollary of Fukuyama's thesis. In 1989, Fukuyama published a paper titled The End of History, importantly with a question mark. He expanded his argument into a book, The End of History and the Last Man, published in 1992. The book became a bestseller, capturing the spirit of the times. Fukuyama accepting or deploying a philosophical foundation laid by the French philosopher Alexander Kojève, which rested in turn on the philosophies of Hegel and Marx, argued that the end of history implied, asserted, or anticipated by Hegel, Marx, and Kojève was now achieved in principle with the universal or widespread realization that liberal democracy, including its basic principles of individual rights, private property and some sort of market economy, representative government and the rule of law, had emerged as the only reasonable or sustainable socio-political order. The end of the Cold War appeared to be, as far as we can know, the last stage in the dialectical development of the human species. History, with a capital H, ends with the end of meaningful political conflict and change. This is all in this view. Whatever may happen, including continuing wars and so on, would not represent meaningful history in this deeper sense because it would not reflect real, rationally defensible, or choice-worthy alternatives to liberal democracy. Fukuyama's timing was perfect. Whether embraced or feared, the new world order, to borrow a phrase, appeared to be the end not just of this or that conflict, but of any conflict among real or defensible rivals among regimes, or among regimes with truly distinct principles and titles to rule. It appeared to be the end of the teleological development of human history, and especially of modern natural science and enlightenment politics. Fukuyama's thesis was in the air, ready to be articulated and popularized, and he accomplished this. The effect was gripping and polarizing. Critics came at the argument from all sides, and of course any argument or theory so synoptic, not to say grandiose, is open to reason skepticism from many angles. What troubled many, however, were not just speculative doubts, but practical concerns regarding the apparent neglect of the ongoing importance of conflict, war, and politics 
in a dangerous, perhaps still more dangerous, post-Cold War world. Or put differently, the risk of encouraging a sanguine triumphalism and a not so benign neglect of the conflicts to come and the political realities that underlie them. Fukuyama anticipated at least almost all of these criticisms and attempted to address them. One argument and book that became an antipode, the other pole to Fukuyama's, was Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilization thesis articulated fully in a 1996 book, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, which argued that the end of the Cold War only represented or at most represented an end of conflict over political ideologies. What would replace it would be an era of conflict along deeper civilizational fault lines, for example, between the Islamic world and the West. In the aftermath of 9-11, and in light of the new wars that the fall of the Twin Towers precipitated, the Fukuyama-Huntington axis became important cultural shorthand for the question posed by the end of the Cold War as well as the question posed by the rise of Islamic fundamentalism or political Islam. While the 1990s appeared to many to be advancing or amenable to Fukuyama's thesis, the post 9-11 world appeared to many to support the idea that new or old alternatives could gain ground against or at least increasingly destabilize the practical hegemony and stability of the so-called end of history and the implicit or pending triumph of Western liberal democracy. Of course, as I speak to you tonight, as, this, as the pendulum swings and in the atmosphere of the, of the moment, the unfolding of events in Syria and Iraq on the one hand and Ukraine and Russia on the other makes it appear again to many that certain sources of major geopolitical conflicts will increase, not decrease, in the years to come. Be that as it may, it is a corollary of the end of history thesis that I assert as relevant to the decline of liberal education in America and perhaps in the West. It appears to me that whatever ongoing conflicts, domestic or international, that America or the West has faced in the last 25 years, including today, none have appeared deep enough to raise the fundamental questions or encourage the fundamental attentiveness to the problem of human freedom as an intellectual problem, one that requires adjudication of the intellectual sources or traditions of the West. None have appeared as robust as the Cold War or the Great Wars period in creating the kind of conditions I enumerated above. In this sense, Fukuyama's neo-Hegelian understanding of the end of history does seem to have captured seem to me to have captured the spirit of the times. One may ask, however, if it is true. In some sense, this is the most important question, and Fukuyama recognizes that this points to deciding between what he takes to be the fundamental alternatives, a modern Hegelian understanding of the substance of philosophy or science being the actually attained state of spirit or consciousness worked out by historical man, or a pre-modern understanding of an intuition of nature and human nature as independent of the accidents of politics and history. He refers us to the debate between Kojev and the political philosopher Leo Strauss as the best 20th century locus of this deeper question, a debate that is itself very much of the Cold War era. However, his argument rests not so much on the claim to have demonstrated metaphysically, if one wanted to put it that way, that the Hegelian alternative is true, but rather on an empirical and provisional claim that a reasoned survey of human development and of the available alternatives leads to a conviction, however provisional, that liberal democracy is the only viable and sustainable alternative, capable of addressing the non-negotiable demands of the majority of human beings for material satisfaction and political recognition. I have not sufficiently noted that it is part and parcel of his understanding that there is much that is lost, much that is sad, and much that is unsatisfying about the end of history so understood. Consequences that were accepted also by Hegel and Kojev 
and lamented by many waves of other thinkers, notably Nietzsche, whose last man, Fukuyama, borrows to capture one of the most critical portrayals of what the world and of what human beings might look like if history has ended or does end in this way. In a sense, my version of all this is even more provisional and even more empirical or commonsensical. However, I take the consequences just as seriously. Despite the arguments that can be mounted to the contrary, it does appear to me that in the West and in America, the end of the Cold War marks the beginning of a period in which we no longer contemplate the possibility of other political alternatives to liberal democracy that might be worthy rivals. Alternatives that might stake a compelling claim to be an advance on our basic principles of government or that might be sufficiently powerful and enduring to displace our form of government. If this is true, that is, if that's the general perception, consciousness, then this amounts to removing the Cold War or prior Great Wars, cultural conditions enumerated above, that provided a bulwark against the loss of the deep claims of liberal education in the American public sphere. It seems to me that in America, the basic retreat or transformation of the liberal arts college, the liberal arts disciplines, and the ideals of liberal education has accelerated unchecked in the last 25 years. The defense of liberal education, and it often has the tone of defense or apologetics in a weak sense in this period, amounts to a thin set of ideals or benefits. Though only thin, and this is crucial, if one believes in the deeper claims and the other alternatives. Part three, and this is briefer, alternatives or objections. First, alternative regimes. Well, there do appear to be at present political alternatives or rivals. The candidates that have emerged as of greatest concern or preoccupation for the West are religious fundamentalism in the form of political Islam and new forms of nationalism or authoritarianism that have risen or may rise in Russia or in China. However, I see little evidence that the popular or even sophisticated perception or consciousness of these alternatives view them as anything other than a regression into something more primitive or atavistic and into inferior or unjust forms of political repression. It appears to me that the voices across the political spectrum condemn the possible ascendancy of these alternatives in principle and assume that the remedy will come sooner or later in the form of the proper configuration of inducements and experiences that allow liberal democracy and its attendant structures and principles to take hold and endure. Put slightly differently, even those who doubt that we are at an end of conflict or on the eve of universal hegemony or extension of our political principles, and even those who fear that another side could somehow win or at least endure on a large scale, even they view such a defeat of liberal democratic and enlightenment principles as a catastrophe, something like the spread of a contagion or an asteroid hitting the planet, not a sign of the potential superiority of another way of life. Obviously, I'm not arguing that everyone sees things this way. This is what I view as the culture, popular culture, popular consciousness. So I think it applies to almost everyone. Second, alternative sources. Suppose one concedes that the triumph of enlightenment and democratic principles does create a consciousness of the end of history and an experience, even if specious or illusory, that the political problem has been solved in principle. It may be the case that there are other experiences part of our culture and consciousness that serve to awaken, to preserve and nourish the deep ideals of liberal education. Candidates for these would amount to a litany of the great anxieties and crises of our age, the prospect of environmental catastrophe or other dystopian possibilities, either brought on by or unremedied by technological progress, including the end of privacy or the loss of the biological integrity of our bodies or our species. <clears throat> 
or great political or economic anxieties consistent with the end of history consciousness. For example, for America, perhaps the prospect that we are approaching a long twilight of American power, influence, self-confidence, or optimism. Or more generally, the concern that economic trends such as increasing income inequality or the volatile boom-bust cycles of global capitalism will create new havoc or undermine regimes from within. Or that new waves of conflicts will arise over scarce natural resources or over other forms of critical economic and technological competition. Furthermore, in a different register, and to put it very simply, if I am right that liberal education is a permanent human possibility tied to our rational nature, then every individual can preserve and undertake such an education simply by asking the fundamental questions. For these and many other reasons, the end of the Cold War, even understood as the end of history, need not imply the last man and need not imply that liberal education is impossible. However, even if liberal education is, in some sense, natural, extraordinary conditions have to be put in place for it to become actualized in the way we perceive it to be in the peaks of education, preserved in the great works of the tradition and in the actually existing communities that are oriented around and animated by an articulated view of liberal education. We cannot underestimate the importance of living traditions nor of the political and cultural institutions that preserve them, nor of the cultural and political discourse that makes articulate and possible the kinds of inquiry and assent that are the substance of liberal education. It is all of this that seems to have lost an important source or bulwark with the end of the Cold War. To conclude, it's very close to the end. Friends of liberal education, at least in the two deeper or more traditional senses that I summarized, liberal democratic and supra or apolitical, do well not to pretend these are hospitable times. It is possible to argue that modernity itself has been inhospitable to liberal education, something that surely sounds counterintuitive to most of us today. My argument here, and I consider it to be consistent with the founding arguments of the St. John's program is significantly less extreme. The hope for enlightenment and for liberal democracy as well as capitalism and the hope to moderate and remedy their characteristic defects is tied to their particular need for liberal education, both as a justification of their worthiness for human beings and as a necessary nourishment, an alma mater in the literal since the nourishing mother of the citizens and the statesmen embodying and preserving the regime. The eclipse of the questionability of enlightenment politics and natural science threatens those very institutions or their beneficence. The Cold War and the great contests of regimes in the 20th century encouraged such questionability and a just sense of the fragility and partiality of all political regimes. It is a question for us whether there is anything comparable available today that might nourish the great tradition of liberal education in America. Thank you all very much for coming this evening. <laughs>